It has been eight solar months since the Battle of Eliania, and I can barely recognize my own home system. After the battle ended, tens of thousands of our civilian ships streamed out from our world and their hiding places deep in the system to help the Republic fleet to search for survivors among the wreckage and bring their wounded to our medical centers. What remained of our contingent that was detached from the Commonwealth fleet arrived a day after the battle, limping into the system and in no shape to fight after their prior combat against the insectoids in Commonwealth space. They received a hero's welcome and the Republic fleet, seeing the sad state that they were in and their willingness to confront the insectoid fleet alone rendered them honors. The Republic fleet lined up on both sides of the assigned course for thousands of kilometers and displayed their battle colors and fired training rounds in salute as the pitiful remnants of our defense forces passed through them and headed towards our world. Many of the Republic ships also displayed a hologram depicting a broom sweeping from side to side, which we later learned was a human euphemism for a clean sweep. A week after the battle, a large convoy of hundreds of freighters arrived from Republic space, bringing much-needed supplies to restock and refit their ships. There was another smaller convoy of massive fabricator ships that also arrived, and in the span of a solar month they already had three Republic shipyards built in orbit around our planet. The fabricator ships were fed by a continuous stream of ore that was extracted from our two asteroid belts by automated mining drone ships. They refined the ore and fabricated the components that would be used to construct the shipyards and later the defense systems the Republic constructed to fortify our system. The damaged ships that were still able to enter null space headed back to Republic space for repair and refit, while the more heavily damaged ones that could not stayed in system, affecting what repairs they could until the shipyards came online. When I commented on how impressed I was that they could build three military shipyards in such a short time, Sire Father dismissed it. He told me that the Republic had over 200 such shipyards in their space, rendering me speechless. I asked him why they would have so many when they haven't fought a conflict in over 100 cycles, and he remarked, The humans have a saying, If you want peace, prepare for war. I couldn't fathom the vast war machine they had at their disposal, especially compared to the Commonwealth that used to be almost four times as large as the Republic and only had twenty shipyards dedicated to building warships. This was the first time I had a concept of just how little I really knew about our saviors. After they finished constructing their shipyards, they also built two more military shipyards to Eliani specifications, so that we had the ability to create our own warships, since we could not count on using the Commonwealth shipyards anymore. This caused considerable turmoil within the government and our people as we were one of the first members and have been in the Commonwealth for almost 200 cycles. The final act that forever cut our ties with the Commonwealth was three solar months after the battle. An official Commonwealth government envoy arrived at the Eliani system and had the gall to tell us that we were overdue on our taxes and threatened to sanction us for allowing a foreign military to establish a presence in our system. Our government dithered, seeming to be unwilling to end our membership despite their betrayal and leaving us to face the insectoids on our own. It was Admiral Thompson who decided the issue for us when he caught word of what was happening and sent a message to the Commonwealth envoy. The message was just two words. Get bent, and Republic task forces surrounded the Commonwealth ships with weapons charged and locked. They escorted the Commonwealth ships under protest to the outer system and told them that any further violations of Eliani territorial space would be construed as an act of war. The envoy threatened dire repercussions to both the Republic and Eliania before their ships flashed into null space. The following two solar months were a whirlwind of activity as hundreds of thousands of humans landed on Eliania to help integrate Republic systems and tech into our own to streamline our cooperative efforts. Republic and Eliani scientists were scouring the wreckage of the insectoid ships, trying to glean insights into their technology and weapons to prepare for the coming battles and develop better armor and more effective weapon systems. Sire Father was recalled back to his old post to serve as ambassador to the Republic as our government started negotiations to determine what type of relationship we would have with the Republic going forward. A large percentage of our executive council and the population wanted to formally join the Republic, but surprisingly, 
it was the humans themselves who quietly rejected this proposal, stating that we should know what it is to be truly free and stand on our own two feet before making that decision. President Lopez made her first official visit for the memorial service held on the sixth solar month anniversary of the battle. I always marveled at the variety of sizes, shapes, and colors the humans displayed, but I was shocked when I saw her walking down the ramp to greet our premiere. She was shorter than most humans I had seen and small-framed, but her presence and sense of purpose made her seem like she was larger than everyone around her. I learned later that she served twenty years as a pathfinder, one of the most lethal operators in the Republic military. For the ceremony, it was decided that the large number of Republic deaths made it impossible to hold a traditional reading of the names. Instead, our government asked for permission to honor them in the Eliani way, and the humans agreed. In the central square of our capital, there were over half a million Eliani and hundreds of thousands of humans, while in the surrounding districts there were millions more Eliani. The ceremony started and I was enveloped by the loudest silence I ever heard. Slowly, by the thousands, small holographic globes of light rose up and hovered above the crowd. The lights got larger and transformed into the shapes of the heads and upper torsos of the humans they represented, displaying their names, ages, and the ships they served on. After a few moments, they returned to being globes of light and started ascending towards the sky until they accelerated and burst into spears of light that shot into space, as if joining the heavens themselves. Another batch of thousands of globes arose, and then another. This continued until the last lights joined the heavens and all 167,538 dead and MIA had made their journey. The emotional undercurrent was so strong that you could feel it in the air as the millions of attendees grieved and the Republic and Eliani delegations openly wept. The next day, President Lopez addressed the Executive Council and laid forth her vision moving forward. She called for the creation of a military exchange program to integrate our forces and to train the Eliani in what she called the Republic Way by posting Eliani ship crews on human vessels and creating an entire class of Eliani cadets that will travel to Republic space and go through their training program. She requested that the Executive Council adopt a wartime posture, declaring the Battle of Eliania only the first of many battles to come. She then showed the Council intelligence from Republic spy drones that had infiltrated insectoid space, showing thousands upon thousands of ships in various stages of construction on several worlds. The spy drones also showed that the insectoid still had ships patrolling their space that were equivalent to twice the size of the fleet that invaded the Commonwealth. She waited until the Council had a chance to absorb the information and then started speaking. We lost more than 1,000 ships and over 1,500 fighters, but we cannot afford to wait. The Republic does not start wars, but we finish them. She paused, looking around the Council with a penetrating gaze. She continued speaking. We do not believe in the concept of a defensive war once engaged with the enemy. The Commonwealth did and look where that got them. We believe in striking hard and fast, and we will always move forward. The only way to win is to drive into the heart of the enemy and destroy their ability to make war. Finished with what she had to say, she put away her papers and opened the floor for questions or concerns. None were raised and she then dropped a bombshell onto the chamber. Before you deliberate, I have one good piece of news. There is a Zenction delegation on its way to Eliania, and they should arrive in two days. They have decided to end their membership within the Commonwealth when they found out that you were abandoned, and they have seized control of all Commonwealth military vessels within their territory. They are bringing those ships with them, and they are also coming to form an alliance and to sign a mutual defense pact with the Republic and the Eliani sovereignty. There were loud hoots of approval from the council interspersed with laughter, as the Zenction were well known to be an unruly member and a constant source of exasperation to the Commonwealth. President Lopez left the chamber and as the council deliberated, Sirefather took me outside for fresh air. You will reach the age of decision in two solar months and go from a youngling to growing your first gray hairs that mark a manling. Do you know what you are to do? He asked, looking at me earnestly. I had already made my decision, but I put on a good show of thinking about it before I answered. 
I looked him in the eyes and puffed out my chest, banging it twice with my fists. I want to join the cadet class and fight for our world. As I said the words, I deflated a little, feeling the weight of what I just said hit me and pulled down my momentary courage. Sirefather beamed at me with pride and hugged me, whispering into my ear, You are the greatest gift a Sirefather could ever ask for. I am proud of you. He let me go and turned away, tears falling down his face. Please do not tell your birth mother yet. I will break the news to her when the time is right. We walked back into the chamber together, having passed through that moment when a sire father loses a youngling, but gains a manling. Two solar months later, I am now on a Republic cruiser waiting with the rest of my cadet class to flash out. I am looking at a holographic overlay of my home system, and I find myself in awe. I went from being convinced that we were all going to die to looking at my home system and feeling bad for the insectoids if they ever decided to come back. There are hundreds of warships patrolling the system, while hundreds more are patrolling interstellar space within 200 light years. Massive forts are littered throughout the system, and there are thousands of defense satellites and millions of what the humans call mosquito mines because they just come out of nowhere and bite you. As I watch the flash-out countdown get closer to zero, I think back to this morning and see Birth Mother wringing her hands in apprehension, afraid that her youngling is going to come back bloodlusted. I see Sire Father looking at me with pride and gifting me his pilot wings. I look at all the frightened Eliani cadets around me that are thinking the same thoughts as I am. Out of nowhere, a human in uniform comes running at us with bulging veins on his forehead and his eyes looking like they wanted to pop out of his skull. He is screaming at us and we flinch as his spittle sprays across our faces, not understanding what is happening. He hits his forehead, seeming to remember something, and activates the translator device hanging off his harness. Suddenly, his words hit us like a hammer as the translator kicks in. I am your drill instructor and you have five goddamn seconds to get to your berths before I rip your monkey heads off your necks and use your esophagus as a fucking urinal. Move! 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 We scatter and run for our lives, not knowing where the hell we are supposed to go.